want you to understand that our God is eternal. He is, he is not constricted by time. But the last time I checked, we are. Amen? Unless you show up retired and have nothing to do, we all have jobs and families and things to take care of. Amen? So we want to respect your time this morning. But I need you to respect mine as well. Can we, can we all say let's respect the pastor's time as well? And, and how can you respect my time this morning? By simply paying attention. Can we have an agreement? I'll keep it as short as possible if you pay attention. Is that an agreement? Is that, will that work for you? Amen. Praise. The Bible says Paul was preaching so long and hard, somebody fell asleep in the window, fell out the window, and died. And then Paul went and resurrected him, and then he kept preaching. My God. <laughs> so that was Paul. So this morning, we want to keep it as short and sweet as possible for you, but you got to make that commitment to listen. Listen with your ears, listen with your heart, listen with your spirit. That's how you respect the, the pastor's time, effort, and energy that has gone into presenting with the Word of God has for us and what God wants to say today. Amen. So we're in a season where we all here in Revive Church have a desire to experience God. If you want to experience God, say something in the chat. Make some noise in the building if you want to experience God. Amen. If you don't, don't lie about it. Amen. But don't leave. Don't leave God's presence and don't leave the teaching because my prayer is by the end of this, when we are done with, with this um, series, we're done with this movement, that you yourself will not only experience God, but you will catch on. You will have that hunger to experience him even more in your lives. One of the worst things you can have in life is complacency, whether it's spiritually or naturally. Once you think you have arrived, that is when you start to go down. I mean that. Whether you're a doctor, a scientist, a musician, you get that one hit, say, well, I'm going to stop right here. No, musicians are always writing. They're always singing. Actors and actresses are always continuing what they do to perfect what they have and also to increase and develop and go to that next level. And it's the same thing spiritually. It's dangerous when you're just satisfied because your sins are washed away. When you're satisfied just because your name is on the roll. When you're satisfied just because you're a member in a church. Yes, we are grateful for these things. But God wants us to desire more of him and to learn more of him and connect with him. How many of y'all are married or you're in a relationship? Make some noise. Amen. Wouldn't it be a good thing to know your spouse? Amen. Some cultures. uh, I come from a culture. I'm actually half Indian, half black, whatever that means or is. Uh, But uh, the Indian side of me, many people in the Indian culture, they have what are called prearranged marriages. And so you meet that person after you say, I do, not even before. And the parents and grandparents, they, they put it in place, and you're just, there you are, you're forced to be with that person. Uh, strangely enough, they have a lower divorce rate than America, but we'll just leave that alone right there. But wouldn't it be nice to know who you're going to marry? Wouldn't it be nice to know the person you have a relationship with, the good and the bad, just so you can work things out? And so here we've come to a God, and many of us, let's be honest, we came to him two ways. Number one, because we, we're scared of hell. We don't want to burn in hell, and somebody scared us into the kingdom. And you know what? If that's how you got in, you got in. It's all good. But others of us were in the kingdom. Why? Because mama was in the kingdom. Daddy was in the kingdom. We grew up in church. And we've never gone through that journey to say, is God really God or not? And we look at the Muslims and the Hindus. My father used to be a Hindu. We look at the atheists. And many of them had good lives, great lives. Some of them better lives than us on this earth. Come on, no amens in here. We don't be real in church. Let me tell you something. If the Christians were all billionaires and everybody else were poor, everybody would get saved. So you got some folk who do a little bit better than some of us, amen. We talking about God is king of kings and lord of lords, and, and, and you driving a hoopty, and they're driving uh, something brand new. They're driving a Range Rover. It's hard for them to see God in that. Come on now. And we understand our relationship with God is not about that stuff, but I just like to be real in revived church. And so there are many who grew up, and so when the Hindu uh, has have children, they automatically start off being Hindus. And you can't blame them for being a Hindu if they have a good life. So until something compels them, you see, Paul was busy killing Christians, not because he hated God, but he actually thought God wanted him to kill those Christians. Some of these Al-Qaeda folk and these Muslims, they talk about jihad. Jihad isn't, I just hate Christians. Jihad is, I hate these people who call themselves Christians, who don't even believe in the same Jesus that they preach and talk about. They respect and honor Jesus, but they see us as infidels. They see the whole nation of America as infidels. They see first world countries as infidels. Why? Because many of us preach the gospel, but most of us don't live it. 
And then we might help some poor and hungry in the world, but America is a nation. We produce the most pornography than any other country. Come on. We, we, we have the most drug deals going on than any other country. Follow me. And we say that we're a nation under God, and the Muslims say you can't be because here's the fruit. Come on now. So I like to be real in Revive Church. So the reality is we can't turn our nose down at them because all they have is what they have, and all they know is what they know. But if you can experience God, Mm, like Paul did. Nobody preached to him. But he had an experience with God, and he could not deny that. He couldn't turn from that. When Jesus' doctrine started to sound like false doctrine, remember when Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood? And the Old Testament clearly said, you never eat a human flesh, and you never drink any kind of blood. And folk were going to walk away. Peter and them were standing there dumbfounded, and Jesus said, are y'all going to leave too? And Peter said, ah, I got an issue with what you said, but you see, there's something wrong here. The problem is, I don't don't just know you in facts or theory. I know you in experience. And because I've been with you, I've experienced you, I'm not going to leave. Why? Because only you have the words of eternal life. You see, Jesus, before you got here, we had the Torah and we had the scribes and the Pharisees, but we didn't have life. And now that you've come, we've experienced the life that you talk about abundantly. And because of the experience, we're willing to press through the flesh and the blood. We're willing to express through the difficulty and the hardship. So we've got to come to a place where if you call yourself a child of God, you need to have an experience with him. And if you're ministering to others, pray and ask God to help you to help them have an experience too. Somebody give God some praise. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not just about experience, please. The devil can also provide some experiences. Revive church, we go from the solidity and the factualness of the word of God, and we compare that to the experiences, and we want to have a combination. Amen? Come on, it's like food and water. Follow me. Food is like the wor uh, word, and water is like the Holy Spirit. Come on now. So you want to have both, and both are critical for your digestive system. Word alone by itself can fill your head with knowledge and information, but it doesn't mean it gets to your heart. Experience by itself can make you spooky, weird, and crazy, and the devil will give you all kinds of experiences. But if it doesn't line up with the word, it can't be God. Let me say it again. If it doesn't line up with the word, I don't care what the experience is, it was not God. But when you can bring the word of God and you can combine that with a realistic experience, the devil becomes afraid of you. Because we're going to find out today, it's not just by knowing him here, it's by knowing him here. And the way to know him here is when what you have here is combined with the power of the Holy Spirit and explodes and goes forth here. And now that you know him, know him, it's harder for the devil to cause you to turn back. You might get discouraged, you might go through some hardship, but it's hard for the devil to lie to you. Because once you know the truth, the truth shall I'll do what? Make you free. But you've got to know it. You've got to know him. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so we're here, Revive Church, to teach and preach the word with accuracy and purity the best that we can. But we're also here to rip open that veil that was torn when Christ Jesus died so you can walk in and you can not just know him in a head knowledge, you can experience him for yourself. Jesus said to Nicodemus, who was a scribe and Pharisee, when he came to him, Jesus said, you must be born again. But see, Nicodemus was going from here. He said, how do I enter into my mother's womb and come out again? And Jesus said, it's not a natural thing. It's not a natural experience. It's a spiritual experience. You must be born again by water and of the Spirit. And we saw right there, Nicodemus was sincere. But because he didn't have an experience, all he had was the head knowledge. And head knowledge alone is dangerous. You know who knows more scriptures than you? Most Muslims do. And you know who knows more scriptures than all of us? Satan does. Because he conf confidently tried to use the word against Christ in the wilderness because he knows the word. Knowing the word is not enough. But having experience without the word is also dangerous. We need to have both. Somebody give God some praise up in here. I mean, seriously, come on. Come on, you, come on, come on, come on, come on. Y'all give God some praise up in here. Ah, come on, I'm talking to y'all in the building and y'all there online. One of the things that kind of bothers me, and I'm going to move on, I'm going to try not to get in my flesh too much, amen? But we have churches and ministries, we get excited about folk who want to take 12 offerings and take your money. I don't want your money, I just want you to follow God. Can we give God some praise for that? Can we give God some glory that you're a part of a ministry that wants to preach the adul unadulterated word of God? And if you cut my paycheck, I'm still going to preach because I'm not doing it for the money. 
Amen. All right. Praise God. Encourage those of us out here who are doing it for the right reason, not those who are collecting $500 lines and $100 lines because Jesus didn't have a, he had a $0 line last time I checked. Amen. That he was handing out uh, fish and loaves in his lines. Come on. Okay. Let's go into the word. Today, we're going to talk about the number three. Everybody say three. All right. And, and uh, a three is, is one of the, um, the one of the most powerful precepts, precepts and uh, uh, principles and precepts that we have in Scripture comes from the number three. So today we're going to be talking about that. But I need you to do what? What I say? First thing I say, you need to do what? Yeah, pay attention. I need you to listen. Pay attention. Amen. If not, that way you know you're not disrespecting the pastor, the word, and what God is doing today. Please pay attention. Hallelujah. All right. Those of us who have heard about God, have heard many things about him, both good and bad, simple and complex, but usually from the mouths of third parties. Come on now. Theories of what others have said. Jesus asked Peter, what do men say about me? And Peter gave him the whole plethora, but then he said, but what do you, who do you say I am? Right? So many of us have heard about God, and it's really sad because a lot of people misrepresent God. Are you a Christian? Say amen. amen. Have you ever misrepresented God before? Say amen. amen. Come on, let's be real with the world. Amen. We're not perfect, so don't look to us for everything. We make mistakes sometimes. Sometimes we mess up horribly, but that doesn't affect still who God is. Come on now. All right, so find him for yourself. Don't just do it through us. We're not the filter. He wants you to go straight to him. Priest in a box died a long time ago. It's important to know God for yourself. If you don't know God, or if you're not sure who he is, Revive Church would love the opportunity to introduce him to you today. Now, the Bible tells us the following things about God. So this is written from his word, the Bible, the 66 books. Whether you believe it or like it or not, I'm coming from there. Let's start from there, and then we can develop forward. So a few things the Bible says about God. Okay, it says that God is love, God is good, God is faithful, God is merciful, God is holy, and God is just. Let me go over these again. God is love, God is good, God is faithful, God is merciful, God is holy, and God is just. So who would not want to follow a God like this? Who wouldn't want to believe in a God like this? Now, of course, we know God is this and more. But let's break this down. So God is love. We see that in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. 1 John 4, 8. It tells us that God is love. It says, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Now, understand me. This is awesome. It doesn't just say that God has love. It doesn't just say God gives love, even though he does the Bible is literally describing the God that we serve and says that God is, is love. Wow, okay. Next one here, that God is good. God is good. We see that here in Mark chapter 10, verse 18. It says that God is good. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. So we see it's not just that God does good things. See, I got to go deep with this because many of you have experienced the byproduct of these things from friends, family, from the government, from your gangs, from your girlfriend, your boyfriend, the person you smoke dope with, the person you get high with. You may experience some of these things from them, but they are not these things. And our God can do more than just provide the experience of these things. As you get to know him, he is these things. God is is good therefore goodness can come from him god is love therefore love comes from him with us we can give love but we're limited because we can only give the love we have not the, the love we are mm, we can give what we have but i can't give what i am that's why at some point even somebody who loves you gets in their flesh and is like i'm done i can't take it anymore why because we're limited in love we're limited in goodness even the most faithful of us even abraham at some point when his wife said you want to have hagar he was like i'll put my faithfulness on the side baby i'll go for the hagar we all have something but as human beings we're limited and that's why we get disappointed because y'all gotta stop looking to people for what only god can give 
Because they are not and he is. Listen, he doesn't just have, he is. So when you are, he doesn't have to go look for love. He doesn't have to go look for faithfulness. He doesn't have to go get some counseling so he can be more merciful. Whether he likes it or not, he has these things and he gives these things because he is these things. God is love. God is good. God is faithful. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. God is faithful. Know therefore the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. He doesn't just have faithfulness. He is faithfulness. The book of Revelation says he is faithful riding on a horse. That's the prince of peace. Come on. He doesn't just have peace. He is Peace, my God. God is uh, merciful. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 31. Let's look at that. For the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swore unto them. He is merciful. God is holy. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2. So when you go to God and say, is he going to have mercy on me? He already declares that I'm a merciful God. I didn't say what you did or did. I am a merciful God. Come on now. All right. Um, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2. Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. I don't just have holiness. I am holy. And the last one, which, amen, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18, because sometimes we make it seem like our God is crazy. The world's like, y'all God is crazy. We talk so much faith and spooky stuff, it's like our God has no common sense. It says here, speak unto all the, and therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you, for the Lord is a God of judgment, bless all, a blessed are all they that wait on him. So we see here he has mercy, he has grace, he has judgment. And a different translation that says our God is just. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 18. So let's just pause there for a second and let's talk about these things. Because who wouldn't want to believe in a God who was like this? Love, goodness, faithfulness, merciful, holy, just. Who wouldn't want to follow a God who was like this? Who wouldn't want at least to consider giving an opportunity of the sharing of our love, time, attention, and affection with a God like this? Who would really struggle with considering to serve or submit themselves to a God like this? So pause here for a second. A big problem with the world, the world's problem, yes, some of them are just straight up rebellious, disobedient. There's some folk out there who just want to cause conflict no matter what. I'm not even talking to those kind of sinners because you have some Christians like that too. I'm talking about folk who are sincerely searching, who are sincerely looking, who want their lives to be better. How many of y'all want your life to be better? Come on, saved or not saved, sanctified. We all want our lives to be better. We want to see a better tomorrow than a today, and we sure enough don't want to walk in some of our yesterdays. Amen. And so when it comes to the world, we're telling them, get saved or go to hell. We're telling them, Jesus loves you. We're throwing up, you know, godly gang signs. Come on now. Jesus saves and all this stuff in John 3, 16. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But if it doesn't make sense, how do you expect them to just drop what they're doing and say, oh, there go a yellow sign that said Jesus saves. I'm just going to go ahead and follow that. Or there go somebody to game and say, John 3, 16, I just feel like I want to change my life and transform. If we can't translate it so it makes sense, those are great seeds, but they don't have an immediate effect. If somehow we can take this good God that we claim to know, this good God that we claim to serve, this good God who we say, once I was blind and now I see, if we can cause him to come alive to them, they can have an experience with him, not saying they all will get saved. Come on, because even when Christ was here, even he couldn't convert everybody to Christianity. Oh, I dropped a hot one there, didn't I? Yes, I did. But do you know what? We'd, have a, we'd see a greater increase into the kingdom, and we would see folk take us as Christians more seriously. If we can somehow display and present to them the God that we claim to serve, the God that we claim to love. A lot of times Muslims don't believe in us and our God. It's not because of the God, but they see how we disrespect our own God. They'll take your head off if you talk about their God. When they talk about our God, we join in and say, LOL. 
LOL. That's how we think about our God when people use his name in cuss words. We just excuse it. It's okay. And the rest of the religion say, well, you must not have the real God because you don't even honor the God you say you serve. Mmm. Now, those of us who are already believers understand that we should trust and believe these things simply because the word of God said it. But for those who don't have a relationship with God, it is unfair for us to expect them to simply believe these things just because the Bible says it. God understands this, and that is why it is critical to know him through the word, but also to know him through experiences as well. Experiences might not happen all the time, but we certainly should take heed and pay very close attention to them when they are present in our lives. I want to take a moment to put a plug in for an upcoming event that we have here at Revive Church. It's going to take place on Saturday, May 15th at 7 p.m. And we're going to have an experience with God. And we invite you to have that experience right along with us. This event will be live and in person, but we will also stream it online for those who cannot attend. Simply go to revivethecity.com for more information. Many times in church, you will hear pastors and ministers talking about faith. They do like that, faith. They say like that, faith. Okay? They talk about the importance of it, and without it, you cannot please God. Now, let me tell you something. Faith is absolutely critical, but when we don't have it, God loves us enough to go beyond our lack of faith, and he still desires to reveal himself to us even in our unbelief. There was a man who wanted to be healed, and the first thing he prayed was not, Lord, heal me. He said, Lord, help my unbelief, and Jesus said, no problem. I can work on that, too. I can help you. You can't You can't give the faith you don't have. The Bible says we all have a measure of faith. But there's some things in life, you ever been there, where the faith you have is simply not enough to match up with the situation? Does God throw you away or does he send a brother or sister in Christ who might have more faith than you? And when their faith joins with your faith, you can move mountains. Come on now. huh? Am I the only one like that who's lacked faith sometime? I've wanted to have it, but that mountain is so big I can't get through it, and I might need somebody to pray with me or pray for me. And so God is the same way. Now, check this out. When it comes to Scripture and even teaching and preaching about things like faith, the Word of God is not contrary when it comes to having experiences. In fact, the Word of God supports it. Psalm chapter 34, verse 8. In the English Standard Version, it says this, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. What is taste and see, my friend? Is that philosophical? Is that theoretical? Is that spiritual only? Come on, what is taste and see? That means something I can experience for myself. Something I can walk away with and say, hey, I know we argue in doctrine here. I know that it says that, and I know you did your research, and and, and, but see, I got a problem. I once was blind, and now I see. What are we going to do about that? And it's harder for the enemy to twist the word or to deceive you if you had an experience. Let me me go here for a second. The Lord was ministering to me more on this. I'm going to take a pause and go here. When it comes to Adam and Eve in the garden, we see that when, when, when everything began, God spoke to Adam. God gave the instructions to Adam. God gave the assignment to Ad, Adam. Listen to me. And then Eve was created. doesn't say anywhere. Follow me. Can everybody say, everybody say, Pastor, we give you some liberty? Okay, amen. So don't uh, base my whole theological foundation of our ministry based on what I'm saying here. I'm flowing in, in the re- revelatory gift, and so there might be some truth, there might be some error, but just walk with me and forgive me if I'm off. Amen? But f- from what I see in Scripture, follow me on this because I'm painting a picture to give us some understanding and why it's critical to have an experience with God for yourself. If you read in Scripture the instructions of what to do in the garden were given to the man, <clears throat> they were given to the head, okay? Uh, and then, almost like a byproduct. Now, follow me now. Like I said, I'm being like a devil's advocate here. Follow me on this. 
almost like a byproduct. It doesn't say that God then created Eve to have a relationship with him. It says he created Eve to help the man who already he created, who he already had a relationship. Anybody been a part of a third party where the, the two were first friends and he became friends with one, but then it felt kind of awkward and weird? Come on now. Anybody here, any, any wives in the house? Come on, come on, come on. Let me ask you a question. How well does your husband communicate? Thank you. Amen. That was an amen backwards. That was an amen in the Greek, in the Hebrew. Amen. We won't say where it came from or who said it. Amen. Thank God for the darkness of the building. <laughs> but you see, Revive Church, we like to be real. Like, what's wrong with Eve? Why is she doing it? Let me tell you something. A good chance is her husband probably didn't communicate the information correctly because men have a problem sometimes with communication. Gets quiet in here. Ladies, can you back me up a little bit? Amen. Now, listen, we don't mean to do wrong, but it's like once we get it, it's almost like we magically think that you got it too because we got it. Or Adam was thinking, well, no, baby, we're always together in the garden, but you see, Satan is always waiting. You know what this look is right here? Let me tell you what this look is here. Two things. Spiritually, it's Satan waiting, but naturally, it's like when my, my, my wife was a little girl and she was playing double dutch. Come on. You're waiting. When do I get in? When do I get in? Come on. Any double dutch folk in the house? Like single rope, you don't need that. Da, da, da. You just, but double dutch, you got to do like this. Come on now. <clears throat> You're waiting for the opportunity. So listen, it could have been thousands of years that Satan was just waiting for a moment when Adam had to go to the bathroom because men have to do that. Or Adam and Eve were like, you know, I ain't talking to you right now. Or Adam was like, you know what, baby, I've trained you well enough. You go handle it. But he was, we don't know how long, but he was, the devil's patient, man. He just waits and he just waits. And so here comes a moment when Eve's by herself and it's like the double dutch. You know, Satan, he just goes and he starts double dutching. He's like, hey, Eve, how you doing today? He starts showing him little tricks and what he could do. And I'm not going to jump on my hands because I won't get back up. Amen. All the little tricks you see in double dutch and <clears throat> they're just connecting. They're just rolling. And then here's what he goes after. If you read it carefully, here's what he says. Does God really care about you the way you think he does? And does he trust you? Read it for yourself later. Because Eve was like, my husband said that we should not eat of the fruit. Then she said, and neither touch it. God never said that. So there was a miscommunication. Adam was probably like, I'm a, don't even touch it. So she was, she was like, at first she was strong and proud. And here's what my husband said and everything. And then, and then the sa Satan was like, okay, I get, I get you, baby. The double dutching and, you know, teddy bear, teddy bear, turn around. Tell you, okay, they're having a good time. And then he said, oh, well, why did God give that rule? And Eve was pretty much like, well, I, I don't know why, because that's what Adam said. Adam, Adam told me that. And the, the devil said, well, you know, baby, why? And by, by this time, the double dutch game is over, and he just stops the rope and said, you know, it's because, you know, God is holding out on you. He is. Yeah, there's some things that God and Adam know, but, well, no, I, I won't. No, no, come back to us. No, please tell me. Well, there's some things. Even about you, Eve, like, I don't know if you know this, but do you remember that when your eyes were open, Adam was already there? I think God and Adam might have this thing going on, and they just kind of left you out because not only will you not die, but God knows that if you eat of it, you become like him. Well, wait a minute. Are you holding out on me, God? Is there something about me or us that you just, am I talking to some women today? Are am, I, am, I, am, I, am I being a fool or am I getting somewhere with this? Because, you know, we, we, we can sit back and say, I don't know what's wrong with Eve. I don't know. No, no, no. But this is how he was working her. And the last thing he said is, well, it, 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 he doesn't want you to become like him because he doesn't trust you. All of a sudden, a dagger went into her heart. How do I know this? How do I believe this? If you jump forward to the New Testament, we talked about this before. Come on, let me go quick. When, when Judas betrayed Christ, it was after he was offended. And he was offended because his opinion didn't matter. You read it for yourself. Judas said, why don't we sell and give to the poor? Jesus said, no, publicly corrected. And we're not going to do that. He was embarrassed. And then he went straight to the Pharisees. Eve betrayed Adam and God because she was offended. That's all. She was offended. It wasn't just a temptation. But when you're offended, it's easier to say, you know what, bump it. I'm going to go ahead and cheat. Bump it. I'm going to go ahead and do this. You don't love me, you don't care about me, I'm going to go ahead. The stuff I was fighting against, I'm going to stop fighting. I'm just going to go for it. Now, that's why it's critical not just to have the head nods. Let me get back to this right here. 
It's an experience. Satan pretty much told Eve, baby girl, you don't know God like you think you do. You have a head nod because of what Adam told you, but he ain't fellowshipping with you like he's fellowshipping with Adam. And he was able to introduce an offense. Now, the concept of God can appear to be very difficult and complicated, not to him, but to us. Understanding God, who he is, and what he wants can be very difficult and complicated to comprehend. Therefore, God had to find a way to communicate and relate with us in a way that is real, but not too assertive, manipulative, or overly compelling. Did you hear that? Because if God forces us to follow him, it's not real. If God scares us every day with visions of hell to follow him, it's not real. So we have to find that middle ground where he does enough to get your... Look, this is a powerful revelation. Why doesn't God just show up? Why doesn't he just... He's, because if he does, he knows that the universe will say, that's not fair. You crossed the line. Come on. You, you, you didn't make the situation genuine enough where they have to kind of find you for themselves. And so he gives us signs. He gives us clues, but he doesn't just always show up. What about with Paul? He did, and then he told Paul, because of this, you will suffer great things. Because I went out of my, the Bible says, blessed is he who believes and does not get a what? A sign. Come on. But those who get a sign, you'll get the sign, but you'll pay the price for the sign. Look, I don't want any signs. I'm good. The just shall live by faith. I'm good. God, show me yourself. No problem, but then I got to kill you. Moses said, nobody, can, look, God said to Moses, nobody can see me and live. Is it because he's, he's going to kill you? No, because now that you see me, I got to put you through something where I have to be harsher on you because you, your relationship now has less faith than someone who didn't see as much as you saw. To whom much is given, what? I'm good, God. I don't need to see any more glory. I don't need to see your faith. I'm just good because the more you see of him, the more you get, the more freebies, the more it's going to cost you. Mmm, that's Bible. Come on. So now God sincerely wants to reveal himself enough to us so we can know who he is, but also give us enough space and room so that we can make a decision to follow him for ourselves without being forced, coerced, or manipulatively compelled. Let me drop this on you. Some of us, we're breaking God's pattern by trying to force folk to get saved. Look, drop the seed, water the seed, and walk away. Pray over that seed. Come on, see. But stop harassing folk. You ever find the more you try to force and compel people, it actually turns them against you? Some of the hatred the world has towards us is because we've been too compelling. Now, many of us, it came out of love, but we don't know how to, how to reciprocate love. So we're going to force people into heaven. That's why a lot of the Bible says in the last days many shall fall away. Why? Because the way they came in wasn't a genuine way to begin with. The real love is not there. Many of us can say we're saved, but how many of us can say that we really love God? Love doesn't come through a decision. Love comes through an experience. I can decide to love first, but for that love to be real, we got to go through some things. Come on now. There's some folk who know him here. They said the words here, but when trials come, they can't stay with them because they don't know him. When it says that I may know him, to know Jesus is the same word in the Hebrew and the Greek that it says when Adam knew Eve or Abraham knew Sarah. It's an intimate knowledge of, not a head knowledge of. Now here's our, our theme verse for this morning. And one of the verses we will be discussing this Tuesday night at 7.30 p.m. during our weekly Bible study. And I'm almost done preaching this morning. Revelation chapter 6 verse 20 says this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Here we see God's posture, his position, or his stance when it comes with trying to connect with us and trying to begin a relationship with us. He stands. Listen to me. He stands on his property. He stands on his side of the line. And then he knocks. And he waits. But he never forces. 
and he never intrudes. He stands, he stops, he knocks, and he waits there. See, my understanding of life in Christianity, sometimes he knocks once, sometimes he knocks continuously, but he knocks. In the world, we have a saying that opportunity only knocks one time. Many of us have lived our lives long enough to know that sometimes opportunity knocks once, sometimes it knocks a few times, but very seldom does opportunity knock several times. See, very few of us have been blessed to experience opportunities knocking on our doors over and over again. Anybody regret some opportunities you didn't take? Come on, y'all, some of y'all regret some opportunities you did take because they weren't of God? Come on now. Especially when we reject those good opportunities, they might not come back again. So when God is knocking, and today he's knocking. If you're not saved, if you don't know Christ Jesus, he is knocking. If you are saved and you're backslidden, he is knocking. And I want to encourage you, don't ignore the knock. Don't just take this as another sermon, another series. The reality is Pastor Das might not even be here next Sunday. I don't know. That's up to him. But you have an opportunity. The Bible says now is the time of salvation. Amen. Take heed. Don't waste the opportunity God is giving you today. See, when it comes to eternity, God's obligation, according to his word, is to only knock one time. He's a just God. Just one time. That's all he has to do. If you receive him, then your eternity is secured with him. If you reject him, there is no promise that you will have that opportunity once again to hear his knock. The Bible clearly tells us that now is the time of salvation and we should not play with our destiny. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? We should not play with the eternal state of our souls. At the end of the day, whether we like it or not, we will spend eternity in heaven with God or in hell with Satan. But the choice of where we spend eternity must be made while we are still alive here on earth this earth. God is knocking, but are you answering his knock? I'm going to close with these words and then I'm going to give an opportunity for those of you here in this building or those who are watching online or those who watch sometime in the future to answer the knock of God, to answer the opportunity to give your life over to him. I've asked many people, what is there that's keeping you from getting saved? What is so wonderful out there in the world? What is so wonderful in the realm of sin that it's worth playing with your soul, your eternity, and your destiny? Let me tell you something. If you live long enough, you will learn there's nothing out there that can satisfy you. There's nothing out there that can fulfill your thirst. That's if you live long enough to experience that. I want to challenge you today, whether you're five years old, 15, or 100 where you are at this moment is the right time to receive Christ. Learn from the testimonies of others. You can see it all around you. Millionaires, billionaires, musicians, singers, some of them in their lives, in suicide. Many of them are just depressed and down, even though they have everything on this earth. We were created to live forever. And eternity doesn't begin tomorrow. Eternity begins today. After death, you just continue your eternity, but living somewhere else. See, God is the creator and the maker of all things. He is greater than all of us. He is the one who created us in his image and his likeness. He is the one that desires for us to have a relationship with him. He's more desperate to be with you than you are to be with him. Therefore, it is his obligation and responsibility to communicate first. It's his obligation to find a way to make it as clear as possible that he wants to have a relationship with us. And hence the number three. Number three. Next week, we're going to talk about this. We're going to go right into it. Our verse, we're going to start with 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, that says, Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Next week, we're going to learn that God doesn't just reach out to us one way. He reaches out to us at least three ways. 
We're going to talk about that next week. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you, God, for your word today. We thank you for what was said and done. And I ask you, God, to forgive me if I misrepresented your words. If I misrepresented doctrine and scripture in any way, Lord God. But at the end of the day, my heart's desire is to do whatever I can, like Paul said, to compel people to follow you. God, this is the way you've given me my gift, my talent, my ability. I don't copy other ministers and pastors, and hopefully they don't copy me. But, Lord God, I am experiencing you in my own way, and I'm expressing your love to others from the vault of blessings and understandings that I have inside of me. With all heads bowed and eyes closed here in the building or online, if you've never asked Christ to come into your life as Lord and Savior, or maybe you have at some point, but you have not been walking with him. And you want to refresh, revive, or renew that relationship with God today. You can jump in with that prayer as well. And once you've said this prayer today, I want to encourage you to tell somebody. If you're online, tell somebody. If you're here in person, tell somebody. Call somebody later and say, hey, I made a decision in church to follow Jesus. I made a decision today to cast my cares on him. I made a decision today to go up to the cross and allow his blood to wash me from my head to my toe. It's not natural blood, but it's spiritual blood to wash away my spiritual sin, not just my natural. Because the problem with sin is something that comes from the spiritual realm. Today I'm about to pray with you a simple prayer. All of that, all of this, just for this moment. Will you answer the knock? Will you hear the call? And will you simply just say yes? It's not your responsibility to wash away your sins. It's not your responsibility to give yourself a new life. But it is your responsibility and opportunity to open the door or keep the door shut. And say, God, I don't need you. I don't want you. I'm good to go. I'm not interested. It's too complicated. It's too difficult. Enjoy your life without Christ if you can. But for those who say, you know what, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of doing my own thing, and I'm ready to say yes to God. I'm ready to say yes to Christ. This prayer is for you. Let us pray together. Repeat these words with me. And those of us who are believers, let's say it together with them to encourage them. They hear a resounding echo of others who also follow Jesus. Let's say this prayer together. Say, Lord Jesus. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I believe that you are the Son of God who died on the cross to save my sins, to save my soul. Wash me from my head to my toe. Make me a new creature, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.